um, together. Um, I think it's difficult for me to start with anything uh, about rule of law and access to justice without bringing into the room the voices of men and women and uh, many of those who are really impacted by the context in North Syria. So I just wanted to use this opportunity to start with a few quotes that really demonstrate some of the challenges that we see in statistics uh, that we are going to be hearing about over the course of the next um, uh, uh, you know, uh, two presentations. And I pulled out a few of these quotes from, uh, from a CARES Protection Needs Assessment that we conducted prior to the earthquake, uh, to the earthquakes that impacted um, uh, all of us. Uh, and I, I just wanted to bring that to the room because it really speaks to the suffering that we're seeing uh, from the community and within the community. Uh, and I'll use a few quotes. Uh, few people who live in non-formal camps and areas far away from the cities have far more challenges. In terms of groups, women and children have the most challenges. Women have no access because customs and traditions, distance, social norms, prevent them from accessing these services. This is actually a quote, you would think that this is something said by a woman, but actually this was from a uh, adult male healthcare provider. Um, we also have a statement from a key informant who's a female inside uh, in uh, Deir Hassan, who said there's a lack of courts, judicial courts, not the religious courts, which result in the lack of registration of newborns the lack of registration of marriage, inheritance, ownership. People are relying on the verbal contract of an imam, not by verifying it through a court. Another said, um, uh, and I'll just, uh, I'll fast forward because there are so many. The community culture towards widows limits their movements and their education. The same thing happens with divorced women whose situation is much worse than the widows because they are considered to have chosen divorce. They are exposed to a lot of criticism from a community for being responsible, but they have limited recourse, legal recourse. And the, the, the statements go on and on and on. And so I think today and over the course of the next while, we will be talking about you know, these sentiments, these concerns that are expressed by people who are experiencing the suffering in the Northwest and North Syria in general. Um, I don't have too uh, long, but I'll, I'll try to frame uh, a little bit of what I want to say. The first is that there, it is clear that in the North uh, of Syria, there is an absence of a fully or even partially functioning rule of law, which impacts everybody. Not having the state institutions, the policies, the laws, even the security apparatus, required to enforce the supremacy of law is a, uh, is, a, is a critical consideration, has been before the earthquakes, will continue to be for a long time to come. The second is that whether we like it or not, is a male dominated social structure. Societal norms are quite male dominated, so are policies, so are enforcement mechanisms, wherever they may be. Whether we like it or not, that means that women bear the brunt of this disproportionate impacts of uh, this um, uh, uh, not so fully functioning uh, rule of law. We also know that there are formal as well as informal governance systems inside uh, the North. And that it, it's not just the complexity, but also the fact that there is a, uh, a, a disadvantaged, disadvantaged population in terms of an understanding and a trust and a space for them to seek uh, more so the formal than the informal systems. And then finally, I wanna say that one of the clear things in my you know, four plus years of having worked as the country director of care in Turkey is that we have, all of us have prioritized, prioritized packages over protections. Whether we like it or not, the response funding being limited as it may be, we have prioritized packages. Food packages, yes, it's important for us to be ensure that people are fed. But in doing so, we've also prioritized packages over protection. And this really must change. And I hope that we get a chance to discuss 
how we can turn the tide so that you know the underfunding and the limitations on protection and the enforcement uh, of rule of law and the building of leadership associated with that enforcement uh, becomes our uh, focus. Uh, I know that we will be talking a lot about uh, aspects of documentation, housing, land, and property rights. We'll be talking about uh, the skills, resources uh, needed for people to gain livelihoods so that they can make their own independent decisions. I know we'll be talking about issues related to gender-based violence in spaces where women and children and the elderly and the disadvantaged uh, uh, can seek protections without um, uh, the fear of uh, being exposed by those very institutions and persons who are there to protect them. I know that that will be part of the conversation. But I was also asked to talk about what I would like, I would like to do more as care, as a country director of care uh, in this uh, regard. And so I will in the remaining couple of minutes. I mean, I, um, I want to, first, I want to take this opportunity to, uh, to acknowledge a few things related to CARES programming. The first is that we have focused a lot on, you know, safe spaces for women and girls, uh, awareness raising for young mothers, uh, protection spaces, um, uh, and our programming has really been very grassroots, very community led and community driven. But I don't think we can turn the tide of any of this work if we are not talking about the other pillar, which is around ensuring that whatever policies are being developed now, whatever legal frameworks are being developed now, uh, whatever capacities are being developed now to enforce the rule of law, requires um, requires our attention as well. And INGOs like CARE do not pay attention to that pillar. We pay attention to the pillar of community-driven and community-based responses. And uh, that is a regret, but it's also an, uh, um, an eye-opener for me. How do we work with organizations that are working on the legal frameworks, the enabling environment, the laws, the policies that support uh, every uh, member of the community to have trust uh, in the um, in in rule of law. Um, we we that is a that is a that is a failing on our part. Uh, I won't call it a failing. That's a uh, that's a that's a part of our program that we're missing. And I'm I'm sure there's a lot to learn from those organizations that are focusing on that pillar. And uh, and I'm keen to hear how we can do better so that we can. Uh, address, address both sides of the aisle. Uh, the second is that um, I feel like uh, to our disadvantage as an organization as well, we have really focused on organizations that have been prioritizing packages over protection. And uh, I've spoken to many women's activists, organizations, platforms, networks who say to us, um, you really need to work with us on building the kind of leadership and the kind of voice uh, for us to be able to lend to the development of policies and protection mechanisms at national level. Uh, and right now we are not doing that. As And I can say that for many organizations operating, especially in the Northwest, we are really, we are really, um, we ourselves are prioritizing those organizations that are able to deliver packages rather than uh, a commitment to rule of law. Uh, and I, I, I'm happy to, for people to hold us accountable for that. Uh, but I'm also hoping that we can come out of this um, uh, stronger uh, in terms of the recommendations we make. I don't want to quote statistics around documentation. I see from the briefing paper that there will be statistics around documentation, issues related to land, uh, housing, land, and property rights. Uh, GBV. So I just want to say that um, uh, as CARE, there's a lot that we can do in collaboration with others right now to really adjust the way we work so that we are, um, uh, we are focusing a little more on the enabling environment, on the systems and structures, rather than just focusing on, you know, community responses. Because at the end of the day, 
people will naturally want to claim their rights, but if there aren't the systems and laws and policies uh, that enable them to do so, then we've only um, perhaps uh, responded to half of the crisis. So I'll stop there. Um, thank you again for having me, Lorena. I um, uh, And obviously, uh, I don't want to take too much more time, but thanks again. Thank you very much, uh, Shireen. I think just uh, to start the discussion, there are at least three points that resonate very strongly with uh, the discussions that we are having with protection partners, uh, I believe both in Northwest and Northeast. The first one is how we can shift from the discussion on humanitarian assistance that's been there for more than 10 years yeah. already to a situation in which we are uh, providing core protection related response, which implies a significant uh, issue on rule of law. And I believe that what you said in terms of people are relying on verbal agreements, it's very, very important because then access to justice becomes blurry and then we don't have the systems in place to guarantee that it will improve. And the final point that I wanted to bring to the discussion is uh, you were talking about leadership. That's another issue that we have spoke about is how have we built the capacity from adolescents because they will be the ones rebuilding uh, Syria in the years to come. Yeah. And the question is, have we invested enough with them in the discussion of what uh, justice looks like, what rule of law means, why it is important for the reconstruction of their country in the years to come. So these three messages, I believe, are very, very important. And thank you very much, thank you. Shireen, for opening the, uh, the discussion. We wanted to connect these elements with uh, how the situation is currently uh, in Northeast and Northwest. And we're very thankful to have uh, different Syrian NGOs. So to open this specific discussion, I will give the floor to my colleague, uh, Moder. So Moder, thank you very much, over to you. Thank you, Lorena, thank you, Shireen. Um, now I would like to introduce our um, esteemed panel of, of experts who will provide their analysis on the current situation uh, of the rule of law in Northwest Syria and in Northeast Syria. And uh, I will start with uh, Abdullah Jarrah, who is a um, legal specialist working for Shafaq organization. Uh, Abdullah, can you please open your camera as well? Okay. مرحبا جميعا انا عبد الله الجراح كما ذكر الاستاذ منظور خبير قانوني في قضايا الاراضي والممتلكات اعمل في منظمه هي منظمه شفق حاليا ساقدم نظره عامه عن الاطار القانوني المطبق في شمال وشمال غرب سوريا بشكل عام في شمال وشمال غرب سوريا لا تزال القوانين السوريه المتعلقه بالاراضي والممتلكات مطبقة حاليا في غالبية القواعد الخاصة بها مع بعض الاستثناءات فيما يتعلق بقضايا الميراث العقاري الخاص بالمرأة أقصد هنا حصل حصر الممتلكات القانوني والشرعي والفرق بينهما حيث لا تطبق كافة القواعد في في شمال غرب سوريا في حين أن مناطق الشمال تخضع لقواعد مختلفة قليلا عن مناطق شمال الغرب حيث تطبق القوانين السورية قبل عام 2010 ولا تأخذ هذه المنطقة بالتحديثات التي حصلت خلال لنقل فترة الأزمة أو فترة الحرب في حين أن مناطق شمال غرب سوريا تأخذ بغالبية التحديثات التي حصلت خلال هذه الفترة فيما يتعلق بموضوع السجلات السجلات العقارية المتعلقة بالأراضي والممتلكات سليمة إلى حد كبير في شمال غرب سوريا أقصد هنا إدلب ريفا ومدينة في حين أن النسبة تكون أقل عندما نتكلم عن عزاز والمناطق التابعة لها وتكاد تكون شبه معدومة فيما يتعلق بالمناطق الشمال مثل جرابلس والباب تخضع هذه السجلات حاليا لإدارة سلطات الأمر الواقع سواء في شمال غرب أو في الشمال السوري هذا الأمر يفرض مجموعة من التحديات مثل عدم استخدام أو عدم إدارة هذه السجلات من قبل الموظفين يتمتعون بالكفاءة اللازمة لإدارة مثل هذه السجلات الأمر الآخر المناطق التي لا تتوفر فيها سجلات تقوم بعض المجالس المحلية 
بإصدار بعض الوثائق المتعلقة بالممتلكات مثل بيان القيد العقاري أو توثيق بعض العقود المتعلقة بالبيع والشراء أو انتقال الملكيات العقارية بشكل عام تخضع هذه المنطقة أقصد منطقة الشمال وشمال شرق وشمال غرب لمعظم التحديات التي تخضع لها العقارات في سوريا أتكلم هنا عن الملكيات الشائعة وهي مشكلة مزمنة فيما إذا أردنا أن نأخذ بعين الاعتبار الخط الزمني لهذه المشكلة وهي مشكلة لا تزال غير معالجة ولا ولم تواكب القوانين التي صدرت خلال الفترة الماضية التطورات التي حصلت وبالتالي لن تتوصل إلى إيجاد حل لمثل هذه المشكلة تزداد الأمور سوءا فيما يتعلق بالشمال وشمال غرب وحتى شمال شرق سوريا إذا أخذنا بعين الاعتبار أن هذه المناطق هي مناطق حدودية والمناطق الحدودية كما تعلمون تخضع لبعض القواعد الخاصة فيما يتعلق بانتقال الملكيات حيث تحتاج يحتاج نقل الملكية في المناطق المحاذية للحدود حتى مسافة معينة إلى موافقة صادرة عن السلطات السورية السلطات الأمنية السورية وبالتالي من الصعوبة بمكان قبل الأزمة حتى الحصول على مثل هذه الموافقات الأمر الذي دفع السكان في مناطق شمال وشمال غرب سوريا إلى اتباع طرق بديلة لانتقال هذه الممتلكات عن طريق قرارات المحكمة على سبيل المثال أو العقود غير الموثقة الأمر الذي أدى إلى تراكم أيدي المالكين على العقارات دون نقل هذه الملكية في السجلات العقارية وبالتالي زاد من أزمة الملكيات الشائعة التي تضاف إلى مجموعة المشكلات التي تعاني منها قطاع الأراضي والممتلكات في شمال وشمال غرب سوريا أيضا فقدان من أهم التحديات أيضا التي تواجه هذه المنطقة فقدان الوثائق زيادة الكثافة السكانية نتيجة حالات النزوح الشديدة إذا أردنا أن نقارن عدد السكان مع المساحة الموجودة كل هذا الأمر زاد من تعقيد الوضع في شمال وشمال غرب سوريا الأمر الذي يدفعنا إلى التركيز على موضوع حفظ الوثائق حيث من خلال الأبحاث التي عملنا عليها وجدنا أن هناك من أهم التحديات اللي موجودة في هذه المنطقة هي موضوع فقدان وثائق الثبوتية أو تلفها بشكل جزئي أو كلي الأمر الآخر السجلات اللي موجودة بين يدي سلطات الأمر الواقع والتي تقوم بعمليات نقل الملكية عليها حاليا تحتاج إلى حفظ إذ هذه العمليات تعتبر نوع من من التلاعب بهذه السجلات فالأمر يحتاج إلى تدخل سريع إضافة إلى تقديم بعض التدريبات للفرق التي تعمل ضمن هذه السجلات للحد ما أمكن من المنازعات التي يمكن أن تحصل في المستقبل هذا بشكل عام نظرة عامة عن الوضع القانوني للعاضي والممتلكات والقوانين المطبقة في شمال وشمال غرب سوريا شكرا جزيلا Thank you, Abdullah. That was very informative. <clears throat> and now we will go to uh, watch a video prepared by our colleagues from GBVAOR with the support from uh, Ihsan uh, Relief and Development uh, Organization. Sorry, sorry, let me go back. I forgot to share my screen. I'm so sorry. One second, thank you, Baba. One second. There we go, I'm sorry. أنا جميلة عز أخصائي جي بي في بحكي معاملي بمراكز حماية النساء واليافعات من خطر العنف القائم على النوع الاجتماعي ممكن نواجه كثير من الحوادث والاعتداءات بحق هؤلاء السيدات واحدة من الأمور الأكثر شيوعا اللي نحن عم نواجهها حاليا هو أمر العنف الإلكتروني زارتنا واحدة من السيدات ضمن خدمة إدارة الحالة تقدمت لنا بشكوى يلي هي انتحار رجل لشخصية عامل إنساني قدر هذا الرجل يتقمص شخصية عامل إنساني وقدر يأخذ منها معلومات عن هويتها عن مكان سكنها عمرها عدد أطفالها 
كثير معلومات شخصيه هاي المعلومات خلاه قدر يستغلها لحتى يطلب منا طلبات اكثر من هيك بلش يتطور الامر ليصير تحرش واضح بهي السيده وصلت لعنا السيده وهي كان عندها خوف كثير كبير من انه يعرف زوجها بهذا الامر خصوصا بعد تهديد المعتدي لها انه هو رح يخبر زوجها ويستخدم كل المعلومات اللي قدمت له اياها آه، انت اعطيتيني هاي المعلومات انت كان عندك رضا انه انت تحكي معي فهون كان عندها خوف كثير كبير وصلت لعنا بهاي المشاعر آه، الشيء اللي تم العمل فيه بدايه هو آه، تزويد السيده بمهارات لحتى تستخدم الاشخاص الداعمين تستخدم مهارات تحكي عن زوجها بالحادثه قبل ما المعتدي آه، يحكي له عنه وفعلا تم هذا الشيء آه، الشيء اللي صار هون نحن وصلنا الناجيه للخدمه القانونيه بهي الخدمة قدرت تحصل على معلومات كثيرة وفعلا قدرت تستخدم هاي المعلومات بالدفاع عن حال أمام زوجة وأمام القضاء لما رفع الدعوة قضاء بحق هذا المعتدي إحدى الحالات اللي تم التعامل معها كانت سيدة متزوجة تتعرض للعنف من قبل زوجة والضرب كان يستغلها ماديا لا ينفق عليها نهائيا بل ولا العكس يعني يستغل وضع المادي بعملها الخاص كان يهددها بالقتل في حال بلغت القاضي او اي جهه رسميه اخرى في امرها هلا عدم امتلاك للوثائق الثبوتيه من تثبيت زواج دفتر عائلي تسجيل لاولادها زاد الامر تعقيد عندها ادى ذلك يعني طبعا ل عدم حصوله على المساعدات الإنسانية وغيرها من الحقوق الأخرى اللي بتعني له أخذ المساعدة وأنا هون يعني كتير أنه انقهرته هيك لأنه هالشي من حقي لأنه أنا ما في إثبات لا لألي ولا لأولادي ما في شيء أنه يثبت شخصيتي أنا وولادي يعني كتير انقهرت لو في شيء يثبت كنت أنا أخذته واستلمته يعني وأنه قدرت أمن شيء لأولادي أنه طرف انه مساعده كلبس الشيء ولادي انه انحرموا هالشيء لانه ما معنى اثباتات نحن سجلت على هويه وهلا عم بستنى تطلع لي الحمد لله رب العالمين انه شيء يثبت شخصيتي وشخصيه ولادي وحكيت لها انه عن بيت حماي هددوني انه مشان ولادي بدهم ياخذوني ياخذوهم مني وطلاق وهيك انا ما كان عندي فكره انه الاولاد حضانتهم معي وانا يعني رايده هالشيء إيه انه نصحتني انه الحضانه معك صارت انه توعيني على شغلات انه انا ما بعرف اطاول حولوني على مركز حماية الطفل حكيت لهم عن وضعنا وهيك والحمد لله يعني إن شاء الله أحسن سجلت الأولاد حصلت على دفتر العائلة ولا ننسى موضوع الحصول على حق الشرعي والقانوني في النفقة والحضانة Yeah, that was great, and big thanks to Ihsan and uh, GBBAR. Uh, now I will go to Kinda Al Hurani, who's the protection program manager with SEMA. Uh, over to you, Kinda. Thank you very much, Mudar. Thank you. Thank you for having me with you today. Actually, I want to start from uh, our colleagues at GBBAR uh, stopped. Uh, it seems that the protection concerns in Northwest Syria uh, that need legal interventions are very high. And for years, the absence of these services made our interventions sometimes lose their meaning and put both our beneficiaries and our staff under safety and security and many protection concerns. The provision of legal services has been challenged and the gap in Northwest Syria concerns contests due to political related issues and operational capacities and sometimes funding uh, issues uh, during the past years. However, the consolidations of risk after the earthquake raised the demands and the need to obtain civil documentations those related to birth, custody, marriage, and inheritance, and HLP-related uh, issues by both IDBs and host communities. Actually, the protection cluster uh, developed a strategy for legal provision that can strengthen the pro uh, protection environment for the most affected population groups and finding uh, uh, durable solutions. This durable solution is about restoring the rights for IDBs, including their rights to security, property, housing, education, health and livelihood, access to effective remedies and justice, as well as fam family reunification and uncompanied and separated children. 
the main goals that we aim to achieve by this, uh, uh, by uh, conducting this strategy is that GBV and CB cases and general protection cases will be uh, able to access legal services which, which will ensure a comprehensive protection interventions by our, our side. And also IDBs, women and men will be able to uh, obtain their birth certificates, national IDs, civil status through accessible and available mechanism. And we hope to reach a mutual, a mutual acceptance by government and de facto authorities to the papers and hope to see this is a part of any political solution in the future. Also, uh, we uh, aim to, uh, to see all IDBs have access to temporary shelters alternative and those uh, collective evictions and risks, risks of evictions are monitored by our teams and refer to related cluster to guarantee evictions uh, effective response. Also, from our side, we are eager to have that to see that IDBs have access to documentations, uh, safeguarding alternatives to their HLP rights for future uh, restitution and compensation process. Our strategy is not only uh, aiming to provide legal services, but to the affected people, but also to improve the technical and operational capacity of partners to addressing the existing legal gaps, harmonize our response for uh, the all legal partners and ex exchange the technical and good practices, practices and lessons learned that can strengthen the technical and capacity of the legal teams on the ground. That's all from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kenja. Thank you. And uh, now I would like to invite uh, Alan Ahmed, a grant and fundraising manager uh, from Salam organization in Northeast Syria. يعطيكم العافية بس إذا ممكن أشارك الشاشة تمام الآن go ahead تمام بس لحظة ايه انا بتكبر شوي تمام تمام حاليا عم تشوفوه؟ يا وي كان تمام يعطيكم العافية انا انا الان علي جراند اند فاند ريزنج مانجر لمنظمة السلام بشمال شرق سوريا بداية رح نحكي عن مخاطر الحماية الأخيرة اللي تواجهها المجتمعات في شمال شرق سوريا فتتمثل هذه المخاطر بما يلي أولاً هي ضعف الوصول إلى الخدمات الأساسية التالية وهي المياه حيث تعاني المنطقة من شح مصادر المياه بسبب انحسار الأمطار نتيجة أزمة التغير المناخي بالإضافة لعدم التزام الحكومة التركية بالقوانين والاتفاقيات الدولية الخاصة بالمياه واستخدام المصادر المائية كسلاح وأداة ضغط في الصراع العسكري والسياسي بين الأطراف المتنازعة كما هو الحال بمحطة علوب والتي يسيطر عليها الفصائل المسلحة التابعة لتركيا منذ أكتوبر 2019 وتقوم بقطع المياه عن مليون ومئتين ألف مدني في مدينة الحسكة مستخدمة ذلك كوسيلة حرب وضغط في صراعها مع الإدارة الذاتية بالنسبة للغذاء المنطقة تتأثر بالأزمة المناخية أدت ذلك إلى أنخفاض الإنتاج المحلي الحصار مستمر مع إغلاق المعبر الإنساني الوحيد وهو معبر اليعربية نتيجة الفيتو الروسي في مجلس الأمن في شهر أيار 2022 اضطر برنامج الأغذية العالمي WFP إلى تقليل حجم الحصص الغذائية بنسبة 13% بسبب أعباء الموارد والتمويل فيما يخص التعليم تحولت العديد من المدارس إلى مراكز عسكرية وإلى مراكز إيواء حيث يوجد في الحسكة 40 مدرسة هي مراكز إيواء لنازحين مدينة رأس العين بالإضافة لصعوبة الوصول إلى الوثائق اللازمة لاستمرارية التعليم بخصوص الصحة ما تزال شمال شرق سوريا تعاني من قلة المرافق الصحية نتيجة تدمير البنية التحتية هناك ضعف في التمويل ونقص في الكادر الطبي والخبرة بسبب الهجرة
النقطة الثانية هي اتساع فجوة الخدمات الحماية في شمال شرق سوريا مع نقص التمويل الحاصل في عام 2022-2023 على سبيل المثال منذ شهر نوفمبر 2022 ونتيجة لضعف التمويل آه لا تزال منظمة السلام تقدم خدمات الحماية بشكل طوعي في أربع مخيمات ومراكز إيواء في الحسكة بالإضافة لمدينتي آه الرقة ودير الزور هناك ازدياد في عدد النازحين إلى شمال وشرق سوريا حيث ازدادت عدد المخيمات إلى 17 مخيم تحوي 160 ألف نسمة غالبيتهم نساء وأطفال مع استمرار النقص في التمويل والخدمات المقدمة لكون 12 مخيم غير مصنف كمخيمات رسمية لدى الأمم المتحدة هناك العشرات من المخيمات العشوائية في كل من ريفي دير الزور والرقة ومناطق الشهباء في حلب يوجد 40 مدرسة تعليمية محولة إلى مراكز إيواء في محافظة الحسكة تحوي 1365 عائلة تعاني من قلة الخدمات المقدمة على رأسها خدمة الحماية مسببات مخاطر الحماية القانونية أن منطقة شمال شرق سوريا تخضع لسيطرة الإدارة الذاتية باستثناء مركز مدينتي الحسكة والقامشلي ومطار القامشلي فهي تحت سيطرة الحكومة السورية بالإضافة لسيطرة الحكومة التركية والفصائل التابعة لها على مناطق رأس العين والأبيض أن أصدار الوثائق الرسمية المعترف بها قانونيا ودوليا هي تابعة للحكومة السورية فقط تقوم الحكومة السورية بإغلاق جميع المؤسسات والدوائر الحكومية الواقعة ضمن المناطق الخارجة عن سيطرتها مع غياب وجود أي آليات وصية تنسيقية لضمان استمرارية العمل في حالات أخرى نتيجة عدم الاعتراف الرسمي من قبل الحكومة السورية أو الجوار الأقليمي والدولي بالإدارة الذاتية لشمال وشرق سوريا فإن الأوراق المتعلقة بالأحوال المدنية الصادرة عن الإدارة تقتصر صلاحياتها على مناطقها فقط مخاطر الحماية القانونية من أبرز المخاطر التي يتعرض لها المتضررين في شمال وشرق سوريا هي صعوبة أو إمكانية الوصول إلى الأوراق الصادرة عن الحكومة السورية بسبب المخاطر الأمنية أو الخوف من الاعتقال يفتقد العديد من سكان دير الزور فقدوا ملكيات أراضيهم وممتلكاتهم الخاصة دير الزور والرقاء يفتقدون ملكيات أراضيهم وممتلكاتهم الخاصة بسبب عدم تواجد دوائر الحكومة السورية في مدينة الرقاء ودير الزور اعتماد و... بالإضافة أن الإدارة الذاتية تعتمد فقط على سندات التمليك العقارية الصادرة عن الحكومة السورية كأساس لذا فأن سكان هذه المدينتين غير قادرين على استصدار أي أوراق ثبوتية كما يعانون من صعوبة في الوصول بسبب مخاوف الأمنية ازدادت نسبة عمالة الأطفال تجنيد القاصرين زيادة الاستغلال والانخراط في أنشطة مشبوهة مثل تعاطي المخدرات بسبب ابتعاد الأطفال عن التعليم وذلك نتيجة عدم القدرة على استخراج الوثائق المفقودة أو عدم إمكانية تسجيلهم لدى دوائر الحكومة السورية بالنسبة للولادات الجديدة التي تمت بعد 2011 ازدادت نسبة الجرائم المرتبطة بالوثائق المزورة بسبب فقدان الأوراق الأصلية عدم إمكانية استخراجها بالتالي ضعف الرقابة والاستقرار الأمني وزيادة الاستغلال يتخوف العديد من النازحين المتواجدين في المخيمات شمال وشرق سوريا من العودة لمناطقهم الآمنة لكونهم يفتقدون إلى الوثائق الرسمية وعدم إمكانية الوصول إلى الخدمات القانونية هناك صعوبة في اندماج العائدين مع مجتمعهم بسبب وصمة العار وفقدان جميع وثائقهم القانونية وممتلكاتهم بالإضافة إلى عدم طلب الدعم من الإدارة الذاتية والحكومة السورية خوفا من الاعتقال والمحاسبة هناك الآلاف من المفقودين في شمال وشرق سوريا لا يملكون الحماية القانونية لهم ولعوائلهم هناك تهديد لوجود الشعوب الأصيلة في المنطقة وهناك تخوف من اندثار تاريخهم بسبب الاستهداف الممنهج لمناطقهم حيث انخفض عدد الآشوريين على سبيل المثال من 33 ألف نسمة إلى 700 نسمة فاقدين حقوقهم في ملكية منازلهم التي تقع تحت مرمى نيران الفصائل الموالية لتركيا إضافة إلى منازلهم في القرى الآشورية والتي حاليا تحتوي على نازحين من رأس العين والأبيض إثر الهجوم التركي عام 2019 التوصيات زيادة دعم قدرات منظمات المجتمع المدني لسهولة ربط المتضررين إلى الخدمات القانونية 
دعم منظمات المجتمع المدني لمناصرة قضايا المفقودين ودعم جهود كشف مصير المفقودين وتشكيل لجنة تابعة للأمم المتحدة لمتابعة قضايا المفقودين وجبر الضرر إيجاد صيغ أكثر مرونة من قبل مكاتب الأمم المتحدة للتنسيق ودعم منظمات المجتمع المدني خارج سيطرة الحكومة السورية دعم منظمات المجتمع المدني لتسهيل وصول العائدين إلى الخدمات القانونية ودمجهم إلى المجتمع وبرامج إعادة الاستقرار دعم إنشاء مكتب أحوال شخصية في نيس لاستصدار وثائق شخصية مع ضمان حماية الأفراد المراجعين له دعم المنظمات المحلية للعمل على تطوير وتعديل القوانين والأنظمة بما يضمن حماية حقوق الملكية للأشخاص الذين ينتمون للمجتمعات الأصلية التي هاجرت بسبب الأزمة وتفعيل الرقابة على نهب وسلب الممتلكات شكرا يعطيكم ألف عافية Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And now I will go to Yara Bashir uh, from the Organization for Development and Environment. Over to you, Yara. And we have almost three minutes. Ashkurukum, ala da'watikum jazeel shukur. Ma'akum Yara Ayyub, mas'oolat qism al-baramaj fi munazama al-dijla al-bi'a wa al-tanmiya. نازحة من مدينة رأس العين في الشمال الشرق السوري سأوافيكم أجز عن النازحين الذين أجبروا قسرا على النزوح من مدينتي رأس العين وتل أبيض في المخيمات مخيم سريكاني وواشوكاني بتل السمن نتيجة الغزو التركي والفصائل التابعة لها لتلك المدن حيث بلغ عدد النازحين ما يقارب ال 35 ألف نسمة منذ ما يقارب الأربع سنوات تلك المخيمات التي أنشأتها الإدارة الذاتية في الشمال والشرق في شمال شرق سوريا ولم تلقى أي اعتراف من قبل المفوضية العليا لشؤون اللاجئين التابعة للأمم المتحدة لأن الحكومة السورية لا تعترف بتلك المخيمات وكأن الحكومة السورية تناست بأن هؤلاء النازحين من أبناء هذا الوطن وأنهم سوريون نزحوا قسرا من مدنهم وقراهم إذ بلغ عددهم الإجمالي ما يقارب الصبت 175 ألف نسمة ما بين مقيمين في المخيمات ومراكز الإيواء في كل من محافظتي الرقة والحسكة حيث يعيش معظم النازحين في ظروف معيشية صعبة جدا في ظل تردي الأوضاع الاقتصادية والمعيشية والافتقار إلى أبسط مقاومات الحياة الكريمة فضلا عن نقص المواد والأدوات الطبية بالإضافة إلى معاناتهم فيما يتعلق بالمستندات والوثائق القانونية والحكومية فقد أدى الغزو إلى فقدان وضياع كثير من المستندات والوثائق الشخصية والعائلية وسندات الملكية الخاصة بالسكان وملكيات الأراضي الزراعية العائدة للأهالي والمعاناة لا تزال مستمرة لتاريخ هذا اليوم لأن أغلبية الأهالي حسب الدراسات والتبيانات التي تمت في المخيمات المذكورة من قبل منظمة دجلة للتنمية والبيئة أن أكثر من نصف المقيمين في المخيمات لا تملك الوثائق القانونية والمستندات الشخصية ولا تستطيع الحصول عليه لعدم قدرتهم الذهاب إلى الدوائر الحكومية السورية كسلطة رسمية لأنها بدورها تطلب منهم الحضور شخصيا من أجل استرجاع الوثائق والمستندات وجدير بالذكر بأن معظمهم مطلوب لدى الحكومة السورية وذلك إما للخدمة الإلزامية أو لأسباب أمنية صعبة لأسباب أمنية وهناك صعوبة أخرى وهو حالة الفساد المنتشر في مؤسسات الحكومة السورية من رشوة وفساد ومماطلة أما بالنسبة للسكان الذين ما زالوا في منازلهم في المناطق المحتلة فهم لا يستطيعون الوصول إلى المناطق التي تتواجد فيها دوائر الحكومية وذلك لمنع قوات الاحتلال التركي والفصائل التابعة لها واتهامهم بالتعاون مع قسد أو نظام بتلك الحجج يتم تهجيرهم نهائيا طمعا في أموالهم من محلات وبيوت وأراضي زراعية فالفصائل الموالية لتركيا تفرض الأتوات على الأهالي وقد تم مصادرة أكثر من نصف الأراضي الزراعية في مدينة رأس العين وتل أبيض لصالح الفصائل المسلحة واستثمارها منذ أربع سنوات وأهاليهم 
يعيشون في مخيمات البؤس دون أن يحرك جهة حقوقية أو سياسية موضوع أملاكهم وإعادتهم وخاصة فيما يتعلق بالقرى الكردية والإزيدية في ساريكانية تلك التي يبلغ عددها 11 قرية إزيدية والجدير بالذكر أن معظم التقارير والاستبيانات سواء المحلية أو الدولية في تلك المحلات المخيمات تشير إلى رغبة الأهالي للعودة لبيوتهم وقراهم ولكن تلك العودة يجب أن تكون بكرامة وطوعية وآمنة وتحت حماية دولية وأشكركم جزيلا And uh, I would like to thank like all the speakers from Northwest and Northeast. And uh, like after hearing the analysis on the current situation in Northwest and Northeast in Georgia, I think this will take us to the um, next item, which is like talking about the capacities and response. So over to you, Lorena. Thank you. Thank you, all colleagues from the Syrian NGOs. There are many issues that we are trying to uh, when transitioning to the kind of services that the protection cluster has been providing into, as Shireen was saying at the beginning, more core protection related uh, response. We also wanted to do the analysis of where our capacities are, because it's not only about how we decide to shift, but we need to make donors shift, we need to make programs shift, we need to make everybody shift. So what we wanted to share with you now was uh, the analysis that we have made on the current legal capacity that we have to address those changes um, in Northeast Syria and Northwest Syria. So I will give the floor first to our colleague, uh, Guj, uh, the coordinator for the Northeast Protection Cluster. So uh, Guj, please go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um... May I share my screen? Yes, please do that. Can you see it, guys? Yes, we can. If you can just amplify your <laughs> slides so we can see it bigger, Bush. Okay. And we have five minutes each. I will make it very quick. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. Just go, yeah, down. Yes, yes, okay. You're perfect, go ahead. Okay, thank you so much, uh, everyone. And uh, I'm Boris Takele from Northeast uh, Syria, the Protection Working Group Coordinator. So I will, I will just focus on the existing capacities that we have and in regards to, to the budgeting, to the gaps that we have, just in general, in, in, in short. So as you know, like if we are starting talking about the rule of law, we need to talk about the existing actors who are you know, influencing the rule of law in Northeast Syria. So the self-administration is one, the government of Syria. We have also the Turkish-backed National Army uh, that has like big chunk of like portion uh, controlling and they have impacts on the rule of law. Um, so, the, the laws that are applicable in Northeast Syria, one is the Syrian law that is actually, uh, they have a presence, call it the security square in, um, in the, some spots, like some small spots where they can run their courts as well as uh, their civil registries. And also we have the self-administration where they can provide uh, documentation as well. And they have also the, the police and they have also uh, the police is maintaining the internal security and, and also counterterrorism, uh, running security checkpoints, um, and also engaging in emergency rescue, rescue operations. And then also the, there is also a court in, in the area where uh, that is run by, by the self-administration. And we have the, they have also the legislative uh, special bodies uh, that are mainly engaged in and in providing and issuing uh, laws. And they have a commitment to prevent recruitment of children, also in Northeast Syria, signed by since 2014 by the self administration. So these are actually like the, 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 the security apparatus as well as uh, the laws that are applicable in, in our area. And there are, this leads to having like two types of documentation. One is a formal documentation that's provided by the government of Syria. And the other one is informal documentation that is not accepted by the government of Syria, but provided by the self-administration. 
Um, and and then, but they can be somehow work in the self-administration uh, checkpoints and you know in in the office of the self-administration as well. But the government issued documentation, for example, HLP civil status documentations are accepted by the self-administration, not vice vice versa. The other important document being provided is the newcomers ID, and this ID is provided by the self-administration, but this document is only provided for the IDPs who are originally from uh, the government control area. And when they come to self-administration, they need to have that document. Having that document is actually very difficult uh, because first of all, you have to pass through different checkpoints, which is not easy. And second, you need to have a sponsor uh, from Northeast Syria uh, who is able to take responsibility on behalf of you. So this actually restricts the, the IDPs to access to documentation. So just I, I just borrowed this map to, to be able to see uh, from uh, the partners on the ground. You can see like the upper um, yellowish color, I mean, the kind of pinkish color is uh, controlled by the Turkish uh, Bax rebel groups, but all the armies. And then the other, the biggest area is controlled by uh, SDF or the self-administration. As you can see, I've tried to point out the government control areas, these are the reddish, very small spots where they run the court and then civil registry exercises. And it is very difficult to access those locations and you have to pass different hurdles like the checkpoints and in the checkpoints, different things happen. And probably we can discuss more on that, what happens there, how are we going to access those locations, especially for IDPs and then also for the host communities. These are actually serving for all the communities all, all communities residing in uh, in Northeast Syria, in regardless of their status. Um, so just we, I would just like to give a highlight on, um, we conducted, I don't know, I cannot see the, okay. We conducted um, house household survey that was conducted, I think from May, 2022 up to May, 2023. 4,312 household survey was co collected. And it reflects that the ID, the gap that uh, they have is majority of the people, I mean, not majority, um, around 43% of the, the IDPs don't have ID card. And then around, yes, around 49% don't have a birth registration. So this is like for the last one year, so this one is not representative. This household survey was collected from some of the camps and some of the, the host communities, but it's not representative, but it will give us a clue how big the gap it is. And accessing to those locations is also very difficult. And we can imagine um, uh, the gaps that we have on the ground. Um, so the current capacity that we have, I mean, we have around 2.7 million population in us based on the OCHA reports. And the budget we have is we have only two partners operating. And then partner one has around 160,000, partner two has around 630,000. We are only doing legal awareness raising on HLP, civic documentation and others. We have also um, assistance in legal advising and counseling. We don't do uh, court representation because of the peculiarity of the context. And we have only two partners operating and responding on that. I tried to, to put on the graph like the, the last four months of, uh, uh, interventions from our capacity. Um, and this is this is a map, as you can see, these are the areas where we have a presence. And then these are the interventions of from January to April 2023. Um, we can see uh, the gaps that we have. And with the hurdles, with all the challenges and the capacity that we have on the ground is very limited. And then also with the complexity of the issues, accessing to those locations, security and safety. These are actually one of the biggest problem that we are facing, but this is the intervention that we can we can provide from, from our side. Um, the barriers, challenges and gaps, probably we will discuss in detail during the round table discussion, uh, but I would like to highlight that the lack of funding and capacity to address the issues is one of the problem that we are facing. And uh, most of the locations, especially in Aleppo side, Mimbich Kobani, we don't have any presence and then also the Turkish controlled area, we don't have any presence. We don't have access to those locations. Host communities, we don't have that much 
big, uh, big uh, kind of presence in regards to uh, intervention uh, rule of law. And you know the hurdles, the challenge that IDPs and local communities are facing to access those locations is really huge. It needs advocacy, it needs, we are trying our, our best to our level, to the capacity that we have, but still we are a little bit tied up with, with, with the resources and capacity that we have at hand. Thank you so much. I hope I finished on time, Lorena. Mm -hmm. You did. Thank you very much, uh, Guish. Uh, and then we wanted also to compare uh, the situation on our side. And for that, uh, do you want to continue? Yes. Um, we also wanted to share with you where uh, our capacity is at the moment. Uh, if I can close this. Okay, okay, okay let's see. So basically, um, what we did also uh, as the colleagues from North is, is that we ran a rapid protection assessment right after the earthquake. It was conducted in 259 communities with uh, about 1,579 KIs. And we were asking, one of the questions that we included was whether they were facing HLP related issues and 27% of them confirmed they were uh, facing either uh, evictions, loss of uh, property related documents, uh, homelessness. So what you see in this map basically is the comparison between the areas in which at the community level, those are the blue uh, balloons that you can see there, those are at the community level uh, where the HLP related issues were reported. Not a surprise, and then I'm linking with the interventions from Syrian colleagues uh, in the previous panel. If you can see that uh, there is a like, like a very relevant uh, concentration in Afrin, where we also have, of course, ethnic groups. So the linkage with what uh, colleagues were talking about the situation with the Kurdish and uh, the different ethnic groups that we have, and the connection on that with uh, HLP related issues. When you look at the uh, the different colors between uh, orange uh, and brown kind of. Um, this is the discussion at the sub-district level. So of course the areas that are darker are the ones where the impact on HLP related issues is very high. One element that Kinda was mentioning in her intervention is that we are now facing mm -hmm. risks of eviction from reception centers. We have about 96 reception centers in Northwest Syria and 26% of them have already re uh, received a eviction notification that could take place between now and the next three months. So uh, we have a magnitude of a problem that is really important, and we haven't yet run the eviction monitoring tool in IDP sites. So this 26% is only related to reception centers. The magnitude of the problem could be much, much more higher. Um, and also, if you look at the uh, cross lines in some of these areas, this is a report that was run with, uh, by one of the protection partner uh, members, Takaful al Sham, where they included the question of whether people had lost their documents after the earthquake. 88% of them said yes. So if you look at the map, you will see that there are areas where we have a concentration on HRP related issues, but also a concentration in terms of the loss of uh, identification documents. We also, in order to see how we could improve the response, conducted a legal assessment with our partners. It is important to say that the protection cluster in Northwest Syria has 85 partners, but only 17 of them are providing legal related uh, services, sorry. Um, so we asked them in the first column, what kind of services they were providing. As you will see, and this connects with, with uh, Northeast Syria, most of them are doing awareness. And awareness, of course, means just explaining the different rights, the alternatives, but it's not core related response. And we had uh, like different issues re regarding uh, birth certification, IDs, some like very small capacity in accompaniment in HLP related issues, documents drafting, but you can see that our capacity has been concentrated in awareness, counseling and advice, and that's it. We also asked the partners uh, what areas were being requested by communities, but we were not providing. And this is what you saw in the video and also connected to the Syrian NGOs that intervened. There is a huge percentage related to GBB issues with 70% on domestic violence. 60% uh, this was also addressed in the previous uh, interventions on disappeared and missing persons. This is an issue that has caught 
our attention because it was relevant in the RPA and it also came out in the different surveys that we have done. Power of, of attorney, 40%, divorce alimony, 40%, inheritance that is also linked to, for example, HLP related to women and access to property um, with 30%. And you see the rest are the, the issues, issues that we already identified, like birth certification, civil documentation, and, and so forth. With this information, we also wanted to understand our capacity in terms of funds. So with this information that you see on the screen is related to our HRP funding. Um, so we requested 20.6. We have secured 7.3 million. Uh, if you look at the overall HRP for Northwest Syria, we have secured between 5% and 6%, which is very, very low. And out of this 7.3 that we have secured, only for like 900,000 is dedicated to legal provision of services. So if we link the, the magnitude of the need with the capacity that we have is absolutely uh, underfunded from where we are trying to move forward. The other issue that we wanted to share with you is like uh, how, the, how scattered the provision of services is. Uh, so the areas in which you see highlighted are the ones where this 900,000 is being implemented basically. But you can see that there is like concentration it's in some uh, border areas, which is relevant because that's where we believe protection risks, of course, are heightened. Uh, but there is like a very scattered response that we are doing with the current 16 partners that we have. And finally, we wanted to compare the situation between 2022 and 2023 related to legal services. What you see on the left side is the services that we are providing in Aleppo. And on the next side is the services that we are providing in Idlib. As you can see, um, our main focus has been in Idlib. This is linked, of course, to security concerns, to the capacity in terms of access, to the presence of partners, but also concerns from partners in terms of security related issues, as uh, our colleagues from Northeast were mentioning. And again, you can see that the concentration has been and will continue and is yet still in awareness and counseling. So what we have done for the latest allocation of uh, funds through the SCHF and the AFNS is to request partners to increase their legal capacity. We launched a legal strategy uh, one month ago to guide partners on how to somehow go further awareness and counseling into provision of core related uh, legal services. And those areas that we identified in the assessment are the ones where we have increased our capacity. So we are hoping to move between our current capacity between maybe 25, 40 lawyers on the ground to 50, 60 lawyers that will help us guarantee uh, this provision of services. And finally, the provision of <clears throat> legal services from our legal strategy includes three areas. The first one is services, individual services provision. The second one is the draft of the strategy that we want to launch for the eviction situation to mitigate exposure to protection risks and guarantee that evictions will happen in an organized manner. And the third one is HLP. In HLP, we are starting the design of the safeguarding of documents um, in Northwest Syria. And all of these, uh, we are hoping to be able to include in the donors development for the strategy in 2024, so we can increase our funding capacity. As said before, and linked to what Shireen was mentioning in the opening remarks, we are also doing the advocacy process with our partners so they can understand why we are making this shifting and why the need is there to move into core protection response and maybe distance ourselves a little from case management, identification and referral and provision of packages. We want to move into legal frameworks and access to justice. Um, but that also implies that we have to create the technical capacity from partners and also at the community level to understand this shift. Um, so this discussion on the legal capacity is also connected to why we need to understand the relevance of rule of law into a discussion of uh, transitional justice. Uh, so that's the reason why we invited to this conversation our colleague from OECHR, 
So I just want to check if Skylar is connected to hand uh, over to you. Yes. So Skylar, over to you so you can introduce uh, Theo into the conversation. Thank you. Over to you. Thanks, Lorena. So now that we've heard about the current context in Northeast and Northwest Syria and from the protection clusters on the capacities for a rule of law response in Northeast and Northwest Syria, we're going to hear from Theo. I apologize that I will butcher your last name, so I'm going to skip it, um, who is currently the head of the Rule of Law and Transitional Justice Unit for OHCHR, as Lorena said, um, to hear about the current needs and capacities to address rule of law situations in Syria. Theo, over to you. Thanks a lot. Uh, can you hear me well? Uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, I'll try to be brief, but uh, maybe extracting from some of the key points that came out from the, the earlier speakers and and this overview of uh, of challenges and and try to uh, bring in back as as you said, Lorena, uh, the the issue of the legal framework. And um, the first thing I would say is um, from what we heard and, and all the experiences of, of the people in this virtual room is that there is a kind of tension between the very concept of rule of law, uh, which is very about uh, clarity, security, transparency, very uh, focused on a functioning state system from the judicial to uh, uh, to uh, to the actual access to, uh, to rights and, uh, and the current situation in, in north of Syria. And I think this fundamentally requires to, to be innovative, as you said before, uh, to be creative, but also to stick to the main principles um, that, that are related to the rule of law. Um, but when it comes to the advocacy, when it comes to finding solutions, uh we we need to be uh, we need to be innovative and I, I know that after 12 years of conflict and violence uh this is uh this is a challenge in itself um so maybe allow me to uh, very briefly uh, make a few remarks uh and and that's also something we encounter uh within the work of of the ohhr office for syria in terms of navigating uh, this, this notion of rule of law in the context of, of the North. Um, I would say the, 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 first, um, the first aspect has to do with um, the fact that for rule of law to be effective, you need to have, uh, as, as an individual, you need to have uh, security and information when it comes to, uh, to your rights and to the avenues uh, to claim those rights. Uh, you also need equality. Uh, before the law, but as we saw, the law is, uh, when it comes to the north of Syria, is a complex aggregation of uh, policies from non-state actors down to uh, also very important aspect when it comes to, uh, to Syrian law, but also the fact that the, the government of Syria is not recognizing um, documents or procedures or um, uh, documentation from uh, from the de facto authorities. So here, I think for for an effective rule of law uh, types of intervention in the north of Syria, it's, it's very much about how you navigate this dichotomy between between what you could call the traditional rule of law uh, notion that is really Syrian law compatible with international standards, uh, and then all these arrays of laws, uh, policies, legislation, code of conduct, commitments uh, by de facto authorities, but also actual conduct by uh, non-state actors that, uh, that impact the enjoyment of, of rights. And uh, I think something very, very clear, uh, even if there's, of course, a lot of challenges when it comes to access, when it comes to resources and funding, um, one main pillar for the rule of law is all this action when it comes to making people aware of their rights um, and um, and providing support for them to exercise those rights and then navigate, uh, as we saw uh, 
where to exercise those rights if, for example, court established by the de facto authorities in the Northeast are not, are not recognized. Um, and this brings me back to another very important point that has to do with identifying um, obligations and responsibilities of all those actors. Uh, and I think here the advocacy is very much about how you can intervene uh, considering these different points of entry. Um, so when it comes to obligations and responsibilities of, of non-state actors, I think from, from a rule of law and human rights point of view, it's still very important to, uh, to recognize that uh, they don't only have uh, obligations under international humanitarian law, as parties to the conflict, um, because a lot of those uh, international humanitarian law obligations uh, might not be enough to cover a lot of the protection risks and issues and concerns that, that you identify. Um, and uh, looking at human rights obligations of non-state actors is key uh, to fill those gaps, um, because under international humanitarian law, it's sometimes uh, silent on a lot of those issues, um, and it's it's a starting point. But we have to recognize that, from the perspective of that framework, uh, it it would only uh, get us so far in terms of providing uh, legal arguments uh, when it comes to the parts of the conflict and, and non-state armed groups. Um, and in that context, there is. There is a lot to be said on, uh, on human rights obligations that are really arising for those actors, non-state actors, uh, by the mere fact that their behavior um, undermine or affect the enjoyment of human rights. And the moment they act like, like a kind of government with, uh, with effective control and that their conduct affect the enjoyment of rights, uh, those human rights obligations comes into play. And they are very important because they're going to be dealing with a lot of those issues that we discussed, which is uh, which is civil documentation, which is uh, access to uh, uh, to rights, which which have to do with the daily life yeah. and, and those rights in that uh, in that in that context. Um, then we should, I think, also make sure that we don't uh, forget uh, the fact that the government of Syria uh, still has human rights obligations, including uh, with regard to, uh, to territories out of its control. Uh, this is very important for one aspect in particular when it comes to the recognition of the validity uh, of, of those documents issued by de facto authorities. Um, even if the human rights obligation of the government of Syria in those areas are uh, somehow more limited, um, they are still um, they are still based on what they can do, and this is a very practical consequence: is that because they have the ability to recognize those documents, and that those documents are key for people in those areas to exercise their rights, uh, this recognition is an obligation under human rights law. Um, so that's something I, I wanted to, uh, to highlight, the, the, these, uh, this need to uh, first uh, intervene, uh, taking into account these complex legal frameworks and uh, take into account these really two uh, main categories of actors when it comes to human rights obligations. And uh, it's true that sometimes we have a tendency to mostly rely on on international humanitarian law, but when it comes to uh, having an impact, when it comes to human rights and designing advocacy, uh, human rights law is uh, is fundamental in that regard. I will leave it to that. That was really a broad uh, kind of overview in terms of the key things that need to be considered, but very happy to answer any of your questions. And thanks, to, thanks again, again for the invitation. Over to you. Skylar, any reactions before giving the uh, start to the round table? Um, yes, thank you very much, uh, Thorina, and thank you, Theo. 
So looking at what we've seen, so the context now, the capacities, looking at the legal strategies that have been produced by the protection clusters, it does truly align with what Theo was saying. People need to be aware of their rights, there needs to be support for them in exercising their rights, and there are obligations on the actors in place. So within our scope of uh, capacities, we really need to look at emphasizing these obligations so that people can exercise their rights where the authorities are blocking that um, and ensuring that the rule of law is met through actors living up to their obligations and people being able to exercise their rights. So on the next uh, round table. Yeah, thank you, Skylar and uh, Theo. So <clears throat> now we'll be moving to the round table discussion. And uh, on the first round table, we will talk about uh, challenges and strategic actions on uh, to improve rule of law in Northwest and Northeast Syria. And I have with me Jennifer Higgins from IRC. And uh, Jennifer is our policy advocacy and communication coordinator for Syria. I have also Verena from uh, CPAOR, uh, co-coordinator in Northwest Syria. And also I have uh, Sarah Adam Chuck, um, who is the ICLA specialist from NRC. So um, I'll start the discussion with, with the question of what actions are needed to guarantee the rule of law in Northwest and Northeast. And uh, I'd like to start with Verena. Verena, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Moda. Um, very nice to be in that event. Um, yeah, the situation in North West Syria is very challenging for a child to grow up. Um, children are at risk of many severe child protection threats and concerns. And just to give a few examples, like grave violations are documented all over North West Syria, including the recruitment and use, killing and maiming. And also we noticed an increase of numbers of trafficking of children, children in detention, and also children living without parental care. Um, already before the earthquake, it was reported that 1.9 million children in northwest Syria are in need of humanitarian services. And the earthquake, um, of course, exacerbated the already existing risks and threats to children. Now we actually talk of 2.4 million children only in northwest Syria um, who are in need of humanitarian support. And that said, so child protection mechanism are not in existence at the moment. So at that stage, most child protection services are provided by NGOs. There's little connection between the NGOs and the de facto authorities. Um, and the response so far is very focused on the provision of individual support, so mainly through case management. And within case management, they often provide cash, and they provide in-kind and also family tracing and reunification is managed within the umbrella of case management. However, we kind of also need to question ourselves that we're in the 12th year of a humanitarian response, right? So how much longer do we really want to focus on individual support without seeing much change? Like, in fact, now the situation after the earthquake is even worse for children than before. And as we are talking about a prolonged humanitarian crisis and holistic interventions targeting the child, but also um, his or her um, living environment um, are really needed to change that narrative. Um, this means we need to shift from uh, mainly providing individual support, responding to a child protection risk to focus more on prevention. So we need to move from the individual support to support whole communities and build up child protection systems and structures formal and non-formal one. And, and I'm not saying we need to stop with the individual support that's very much needed, but we also need to think beyond the individual support. Um, I'm taking the example of unaccompanied and separated children. Is that a key issue in North West Syria? And we just recently digged into the root causes of family separation, and they are, they are numerous and very diverse. So there's not a single approach or a, nor a single sector who can actually target um, the root causes of family separation. And therefore, um, integrated approaches and um, um, yeah, multi-sectoral interventions are actually needed. And some of the root causes are fueled by um, harmful and cultural norms, attitudes, and behavior. 
And these, for example, need to be addressed by a whole of population approach. The topics of positive parenting, for example, but also raising awareness about the different developmental stages of childhood, including adolescence, um, seem to be very important to get discussed. In addition, um, it's recommended to explore how to strengthen the legal responsibility of parents to actually take care of their children. Um, we also need to strengthen the system of supporting families who are already at higher risk of family separation. For example, children with identified family structures that often lead to family separation, like female-headed household, they need clear monitoring and family support. It doesn't need to be under case management. It can be a community approach who can actually um, work on it. And very important is to understand that most unaccompanied and separated children are adolescent boys. So we really need to invest more specifically to support and address um, adolescent boys. And yeah, overall for the topic of um, unaccompanied and separated children, it requires really standardized and interagency structures and procedures, and that also includes guidelines for legal procedures of abandoned children. Another key child protection concern in Northwest Syria is child recruitment and then also children in detention. It's similar as for the topic of family separation. We really need to ask ourselves how can we prevent recruitment and also children ending up in detention? And um, as of now, there's a lack, lack of information, and we really need to dig deeper into, uh, into the topic to find durable solutions. Um, however, for this child protection risk, we need to make de facto authorities accountable, and joint advocacy will be needed. In addition, we also need more organizations who really focus on supporting children in detention. There's currently also a gap in responding um, for those children. Among other issues, and it's been mentioned a couple of times now, is the civil registration, including the birth certificates, one of the big concerns in Northwest Syria. So births frequently go undocumented, leaving children at high risk of statelessness. And a previous NSC research found that 20% of all surveyed respondents aged five years or even younger were not listed in a family booklet. They didn't have like a birth certificate nor a birth um, notification. And of course, unregistered children are very vulnerable um, for child protection risks and also access to education or other um, essential services is very limited for undocumented or underdocumented children. And for example, children need to have an ID card issued by a de facto authority if they want to apply for primary or secondary exams. So as child protection actors, we need to address that um, Legal interventions have not been prioritized in our programs, but we really need to look um, in, into the topic of civil registration components and what can be done to ensure that the next generation of Syrians are not undocumented. Um, yeah, to sum it up, the needs are growing, um, the resources are limited, and we really need to shift our focus on prevention, building up systems and structures, which also integrate legal components to protect children. And also to do that, we really need integrated approaches working closely with the protection sector, education, health, but also um, livelihood. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you, Verena. And uh, now I would like to invite Jennifer to hear her thoughts uh, from the policy and advocacy uh, point of view. Thank you, so you very much for having me. And I agree with Sherry. It's a bit difficult to know where to look because we have the camera in front and a very nice participant in the room also. Um, I think what's really been clear today, especially from the presentations that we've had, is that this is an ongoing acute protracted crisis, which year on year brings new challenges, which create further barriers, especially when it comes to protection. And I think the elephant in the room for all of us, and I think as Lorraine has summed up uh, very clearly, is that the magnitude of the needs uh, doesn't really meet our capacity to respond, especially when it comes to the kind of funding that we're seeing being made available, especially when it comes to uh, sectors such as protection. And I think this is really going to be a clear issue that's coming up repeatedly during this Brussels conference and in a lot of the side events that we're having. I think, you know, with these year on year challenges and new crises, it creates further barriers uh, for sustainable futures for Syrians inside Syria and protection and rule of law is really uh, key to that. 
you know, the great scale of needs, the continuing violations of international humanitarian and human rights law, continuing displacement, increase in negative coping mechanisms. You know, we've been hearing it from Verena, we're hearing it from all of the other participants, so I won't take the time to repeat many of those things. And also increasing gender-based violence. And I think the video from uh, our partner, Islam, showed very clearly the kind of challenges that women are specifically facing when it comes to accessing. Uh, you know, rule of law and legal mechanisms, especially when it comes to violations, uh, you know, and accountability for gender based violence. You know, this is all, as we have heard already, created a weakened protective environment. It also undermines resilience and it challenges recovery. You know, it places a strain on individuals and communities uh, to secure their basic needs and also to ensure their safety. You know, many, especially uh, in the Northwest, as we have heard, have been through multiple displacement cycles. And then in areas such as Northeast Syria, we have duplicity of legal structures, which place both physical uh, and administrative uh, burdens on people in order to be able to access the kinds of documentation that they need to, to access basic services and rights. I think also, you know, in general, we're finding that opportunities are quite limited due to the political context and the different powers and de facto ruling authorities uh, in the parts of Syria create a lack of a uniform you know execution of rule of law which often provides extra challenges so I think when we go back to looking at that question which you posed Motor, which was specifically around you know guaranteeing like what can we do to guarantee rule of law in northeast and northwest Syria uh, as I said I think key to this will certainly be around access to increased funding and donors really will have an essential part to play within this, you know, in order to expand legal assistance to really meet those increasing needs that we've been hearing our partners in Syria and also in the room today talking about, we really need to ensure that there is increased funding in order to be able to do this in a sustainable long term basis. And that means also looking at the kind of funding that's made available to make sure that it's not just short term, you know, cycles of uh, funding, but looking at system strengthening, and that means multi-annual, more flexible funding, which can also increase the kinds of protection services on a longer term basis that we'll be able to provide. And I think that moves a lot into, Lorena, what you were saying about looking forward, uh, you know, in the years to come. Uh, I think also from the work that we've been doing in IRC, we've been seeing that cash for protection is also really uh, an essential part of a response. Uh, Post-earthquake, you know, we found this really essential. A uh, rapid needs assessment that we did at the time, which I worked with you on, <laughs> you know, showed that around 90% of the households had a decrease in their access to income uh, generation sources. Uh, and also one in five of the households we interviewed had a lack of civil documentation. They also cited that the key barrier that they had for accessing their civil documentation uh, was cost and also transportation cost. You know, so if we're really looking at how we want to and as we've heard from everybody, this, you know, access to civil documentation is really our key barrier in terms of creating and generating better rule of law within North Syria, you know, providing communities and individuals with the assistance that they need in order to be able to get to those services, I think is really key moving forward and should be a big part, especially when we look at the kinds of assistance we are looking for donors to provide. I think also we need to make sure that uh, all of our protection systems moving forward is gender informed. And while we're seeing this global decrease in overseas development assistance, you know, a tightening of um, wallets in terms of the amount of money that's being given to crisis, long term protracted crises such as Syria, when we are looking at designing and implementing our uh, protection and rule of law services, that we make sure that they are gender informed because it's been really clear coming out today that this is going to be. Uh, a vital need and it's often something that gets reduced whenever the overall budget gets reduced so we need to make sure it's always at the forefront of the work that we're doing in order to make sure that we can you know guarantee accessible rule of law for all in North Syria. I think also looking at building capacities of local authorities especially when it comes to international human rights and humanitarian law is going to be key including the Geneva Convention, protection of civilians and especially the rights of detainees. Uh, also looking to improve the functionality and access to informal justice systems that do exist in North uh, East Syria and North West Syria. You know, and this includes tribal systems, religious authorities and local uh, municipalities because those systems do exist and we should be understanding and uh, figuring out how we can build, you know, understanding, knowledge, capacity, etc. 
Uh, also, we need urgent solutions to registering civil status of third country nationals and their children, especially in northeast Syria. Um, it's also key in terms of guaranteeing access to rule of law, especially in northeast for those, uh, especially in parts such as Al Khor or Al Raj. Uh, and I think also, finally, we need to strengthen our referral pathways for organizations and private actors. You know, we, we exist with each other to build a sustainable future forward, and we need to make sure that we're working collectively to make sure that we have um, a holistic and sustainable approach moving forward for Syrians that are living within Syria. And also, we need to make sure that we're working with those uh, and referring to those that organizations, especially that have representation possibilities, both inside uh, non-government controlled areas and government controlled areas. Thank you. I Thank try you. not to take up too much time because I can clock in front of me also. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, sir. Uh, Jennifer. And um, now I would like to invite uh, Sarah, a class specialist from NRC. Over to you, Sarah. Is she there? She shouldn't. Is is she there? I don't know. I mean, you can, you can get the phone. Uh, Fatma, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. But I'm waiting for Sarah as she wants to present points for ECLA. So maybe you can start, Fatma, till we have Sarah with us. Give me a minute to discuss, uh, to check with her. If she not her, I will start. Ah, she says she's online, but she needs to enable her, her camera and, uh, and my Sarah, Sarah, I don't check. Sarah, can you try now? Uh, can yeah. you can you enable her because she's not yeah, yeah. able to? Yeah, yeah. we did. Okay, hopefully you can. Yes. We can hear you now and Camera. we can't see you now. <laughs> Not yet. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, can you try again? And uh, Sarah, you have three minutes. Hi, so apologies for this. Um, sorry, hopefully you can see and hear me now. Yeah, we um, can. Yeah, I'll keep my, um, my comments um, brief um, because I don't want to repeat things that um, other colleagues have already, um, already stated. I think they provided us a good example of the legal framework, both domestic um, and international law, uh, as well as some clear data on the needs. I think one of the key things to focus on is what does this mean in terms of the lived experiences for those in Northwest and Northeast Syria um, as they try to navigate this complex legal landscape. And also, and again, as others have stated and Lorraine said at the outset, um, how do we provide legal support in line with humanitarian principles given the complexities of this, of this landscape? Uh, as we all know, the conflict um, and areas of territorial control in Syria have not been static over the past 12 years. Uh, and what that has meant is different de facto authorities throughout that period um, have each issued their own documents. Uh, and so it's created this myriad of documents which people must people might um, uh, possess at this point um, and trying to again see which ones will be accepted by which authorities. I think we're also again 12 years on looking at this increasingly becoming multi-generational. So you have children being born to a generation that themselves is undocumented or has not been able to document their marriages um, or births. And this is only going to continue. Uh, and I think also for those living again in Northwest and Northeast Syria, it's often you know an option, what is the least bad option? Um, and this is something we've gotten from our own direct work, um, from research and focus groups. You know, can obtain the, the documents issued by de facto authorities with the knowledge that these will not be recognized of those areas of control. 
uh, for those who want to uh, try to obtain government documents, it's often involved very risky, costly travel. Uh, and again, I think there's issues related to freedom of movement um, and access to documentation, particularly for those in camps in Northeast Syria, where they cannot freely move and cannot obtain, um, obtain documents from the registries. Um, so if I was looking at, again, just to, with cognizant of the time, what would be the clear recommendations for rule of law in, uh, in both Northwest and Northeast Syria? I think one thing that, that's, that's missing from my side, um, and I think Theo touched on it, is trying to have some global guidance and framework on how do we engage implementation issued by de facto authorities or non-state actors. And I know Martina wasn't able to join, but I think it also, this has been discussed with the Global Protection Cluster, the task team on law and policy, because Syria is not the only context in which this is arising. In fact, there's a growing number of places where there's a proliferation of documents by different authorities. I think we have to have, and I'm, I'm really thankful that other speakers have mentioned the gender dimension, ensuring that there's you know, gender equality, both in the, in the actual black letter of the law. So we know that's not the case with the nationality law. Um, and I think there should be greater advocacy for changing that for women to provide their citizenship to their children. So, um, as well as I think just in general, the, um, the gender dimensions of documentation. So documents that are issued at a household level or, you know, lack of female staff in, in civil registries, lack of supporting documentation, particularly again for women whose husbands may have died or disappeared or missing, unless if they're able, unable to prove that, that relationship, their children are at risk of statelessness. We've also seen situations of collective punishment. Um, in so, so women being denied access to documentation um, on the alleged affiliation of male family members, whether it um, or others. Um, I think on that note, one thing that we've advocated for, and I think we need to continue to press, is to ensure documents, no matter which authority has issued them, are not conflated with affiliation or support for that group, and a recognition that in, for people that are living in those areas, those may be the only documents uh, available to, to document vital life events, and they should be accepted as prima facie evidence of the happening of those events. Um, and I think, again, what we're, one of the reasons we're all here is to expand humanitarian programming um, and support on legal assistance with a view to the short, medium, and long-term impacts. Um, and it is, again, a difficult thing to for when uh, none of us really know what the future holds uh, for Syria. So how do we look at what are some of the long-term effects uh, and preventing against statelessness? I think with donors, um, as others have said, increased funding for key for legal assistance programs. Um, but I also would advocate for greater clarity on engagement with de facto authorities on these issues um, in both Northwest and Northeast, particularly Northwest, where we repeatedly hear that there's red lines in terms of engagement to have some clarity on that. And finally, and again, um, colleagues from the GBV and, and CP subclusters have already mentioned, but I think also looking for the linkages between legal identity, civil documentation, and how that plays into child protection concerns and GBV concerns. Um, so I'll pause there. I'll stop there. But those, um, I've been looking forward to the to the Q and A and discussion. Thank you, Motor. Thank you, thank you, Sarah. So um, <clears throat> I'm gonna take like two questions like two pressing questions from uh, colleagues online or here in the room. Click on the chat, the Q&A link down there. Oh, oh. there are a few comments. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, do you wanna um, ask the question? They can raise their hands and then we can unmute them. Yeah, like uh, for colleagues online, you can raise your hand and we can hear your question. Yeah, Verena already answered the question on child protection, so that's yeah. done. 
can refer to it quickly. So there was a question um, on um, the cases of boys getting separated from their mothers because they live in oh my video because they live in um, widow camps. So and what can be done um, about it? So what's happening is that child protection actors they're actually advocating that. Um, and the children are not getting separated. So there was this practice that boys in the age of 13 have to move out from the camp. So now they've been advocating that they can actually stay together. So what happened is when the boys are 13 and that age, that they're not allowed to live in the um, widow camp anymore. The practice is that the family moves out um, with the child into another camp um, so that they can stay together. So that was a practice by... Um, I heard like the de facto authorities who um, wanted the separation, but it's uh, on hold in some areas um, because of advocacy, but that needs to go on. So definitely it's still an issue um, and to explore what else can be done. And I mentioned a few of the uh, things before and about the family separation, like um, there needs to be a focus for um, those um, boys, adolescent boys, how we can support them. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, we'll take questions from Yahya and then from Murad. Thank you so much. Do you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. All right. Well, the question is more of a general overview after hearing uh, from the experts from the North East and Northwest. Uh, regarding the situation well and given the past experience of the census that uh, was conducted in 1962 i think uh, for where the kurdish um, i mean the kurdish a uh, huge chunk of them did not uh, get the citizenship um, until it was restored in uh, 2011 so given this bad experience happening due to a census so in what way we can guarantee that this will not be happening in the future i know one way is that we are working on which is the legal work which is very much indeed needed but uh, what other forms of advocacy can be made in order to guarantee uh, nothing else will be uh, done in the same manner so no people from the northeast and northwest will lose this right thank you so much thank you Yahya. um i take the question from murad and then we'll answer go ahead murad okay uh thank you very much uh, can you hear me yeah okay um so thanks to all the speakers first of all and to the the, the discussions my question is, um, I'll kind of reiterate what I tried to write, maybe if not clear on transitional justice and its definition in this context, because what I've understood from all this, which is very useful for me, at least, is um, a, a, go a good understanding at the end of the day of what it means to be doing protection work, legal aid and support to civil documentation issues in this operating environment, which is, you know, given all of the political, legal and ongoing at, uh, security risks, but um, I, I understood from the at least introduction that um, I, I'm trying to understand, at least to my mind, how we're understanding or defining transitional justice per se um, in this context, especially coming from a context like uh, South Sudan or others where you see that usually part and parcel of a political or peace agreement. Um, that accompanies it, and then you have transitional justice mechanisms that are looking into that, including such as issues of reconciliation, truth, um, and, and all of those type of things that are associated. So, so is the discussion really about um, uh, the challenges of doing protection legal aid work in the environment as we find it today, or are we trying to envisage a transitional justice process, or is it in uh, some kind of a thinking at, at, at any level? Um, so that's that's uh, one one question I, I I wanted to put to the group. If that's thank you, thank you, Murad. Um, thank you. So um, Jennifer, we want to talk about the like advocacy piece from the question, and I go to Sarah too. Um, Certainly, yeah. Thank you very much and really nice to be able to have this discussion, even though we're running out of uh, time swiftly and I think most of us here are dying from the heat. <laughs> um, 
But yeah, no, I think definitely there's always going to be concerns about repetition uh, in terms of loss of access to certain legal provisions, especially as the context continues to change and it's very dynamic. And I think year on year, as we know, uh, it's very difficult to predict what different um, political uh, geographical changes might happen that might put people further at risk of losing access to civil documentation as, uh, as was mentioned by Yahia. Uh, I think in terms of advocacy and what we can do towards this is similar to what has been mentioned by many people in the room today and you know as we discussed which is obviously about increasing uh, the funding being made to be able to ensure that we have communities being able to access the kinds of legal services that they need, including access to the correct avenues to be able to get the civil documentation that they need, because it's very clear from everyone today that this is our, our, our key barrier and challenge to be able to access uh, all of the wide range of protection services, but also other basic needs. Uh, I think also in terms of that uh, capacity building and also the referral pathway, I think ensuring that we have a comprehensive approach across each of these things will create complementary pathways and ensure sustainability moving forward, especially if we look at lessons learned in terms of what's happened before, uh, to really ensure that, that we don't uh, have communities facing uh, those issues again and that we can ensure that there is a continuation of services and a kind of resilience provided to those services to ensure that any kind of crises that happen moving forward ensure that people remain protected, especially when it comes to access to yeah, documentation. Thank you. thank you, thank you, Jennifer. Sarah, you have like one minute to address the transitional justice question. Um, so on that, I mean, it's a, it's an excellent point. What does transitional justice mean in the Syrian context uh, today? I don't really have a, a, a simple answer on that. I mean, I think I've been working, you know, in Syria long enough where there were initiatives uh, earlier in about 2014, where there was the AJAX and ILAC programs that were meant to essentially create almost shadow registries that would be merged in a post-conflict setting. Um, we're not talking in, in those terms at the moment, so I don't know how we're framing, you know, what the framing is. One of the, um, I mean, one of the, the, the base goal for me is maybe not necessarily the language of transitional justice, but in terms of just ensuring documentation. I mean, so this is one of the things that comes up with, again, our team's work is you know proof of existence that you don't have an, a child that lives and dies and there's literally no documentation that they exist um, and whether those documents could be recognized at a later date but but again i don't have a simple answer to that one um unfortunately i don't know if others do uh yahia two excellent points sorry i'll, I'll wrap up um i don't have yeah also excellent com comment on the kurdish minority what happened with the census as we know with all things in Syria, it's, you know, even civil documentation becomes massively politicized, um, but it is something we keep, you know, it, whether they're, how this will affect religious ethnic minorities or even de demographic changes. So again, Yahya, I think we've discussed previously on HLP issues where this might come up. Um, and again, how will documents be used? So I think there's, we've also had the discussion in Northwest Syria as they're issuing ID cards um, and linking those more to salaries. Um, how else might they be used? And the short answer is we we don't know. Um, I think there is stuff we could learn, you know, particularly on global and regional work on statelessness. Um, but yeah, again, not a not a um, excellent point, but I don't have a, a, a straightforward answer on that. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Sarah, uh, and thanks, Jennifer, and uh, Verena, of course, like for the valuable contribution. Um, what you, Verena? Yeah. <laughs> So we were we were discussing and thank you very much for our panelists. I know uh, Lutfi, you have your hand up. Promise to give you the floor when we finalize this um, this discussion. Um, so we talked a little about the actions, and but we also wanted to address where we identified the opportunities and the challenges that uh, are there. Maybe from the previous discussion, some of these challenges have already been uh, mentioned. So. Just to give like a quick overview about this, we have with us for this discussion, uh, Farid Fakuri, um, which is the um, co-coordinator for the GBB AOR in Northwest Syria. So Farid, over to you, if you can share with us like some specific challenges, opportunities that you have identified uh, for GBB and rule of action. So over to you, uh, Farid. Thank you, thank you, Lorena. Yeah, I would, uh, I would like to start with the challenges. Um, and, and first of all, would be the most important challenge is the discrimination. 
um, that still prevents women and girls from accessing legal, legal protection and services. Um, you know, inequalities in power and, and gender norms uh, contribute to GBV, at the same time hindering women's participation in decision-making, public, social, and political realms. And above all, of course, legal sector, uh, which is we can all sense in uh, Northwest Syria, lack of female attorneys, for example, or legal specialists, female legal specialists and judges. So these patriarchal rooms, uh, traditions, and also institutions that maintain gender inequality, and of course, most of them uh, unfortunately normalize these uh, violations uh, against women and girls and stigmatize even uh, and even stigmatize women uh, and girls demanding uh, exercising their legal rights uh, or even uh, seeking legal uh, solutions for any injustice uh, they face like uh, family issues, inheritance, and domestic violence above all. Um, another challenge, which is um, the kind of like, you know, um, um, and, uh, this is stigma that arises because of this uh, negative attitude towards or against women asking for their rights. Uh, I can mention quickly, for example, in the last um, GBV IMS report, uh, the first quarter of 2023, that of the total services with declined referrals, more than 30% were for legal assistance services. So GBV uh, survivors declined referrals, mostly due to this sensitivity uh, of the service, uh, besides the presence of barriers, um, for example, uh, fear of uh, retaliation, uh, besides, of course, the absence of community acceptance uh, of these or such legal services to be delivered to women and girls. Uh, I may add also another challenge, which is the lack of trust uh, in the rule of law and any kind of like a judicial uh, system in Northwest Syria. Uh, we hear that from many GBV experts in focus group discussions uh, conducted recently in Aleppo and Idlib, many of them mentioned that uh, many at-risk women and girls and GBV survivors abstain from restoring legal uh, solutions or even requesting help uh, from de facto law and judicial uh, uh, systems in Northwest Syria due to this lack of trust or feeling like this despair of, of gaining the rights through these de facto legal channels. Um, another another layer of, of, of uh, challenges could be also the kind of gap of legal awareness and the capacity of the GBV field workers, which we believe it is uh, uh, very essential to properly advise and refer GBV cases and minimize legal consequences that might face uh, a woman and girls. Unfortunately, many GBV cases got complicated and uh, legal consequences due to this uh, um, kind of lack of awareness or awareness weakness in legal matters in Northwest Syria context. Uh, another challenge could be also the absence of legal specialized uh, or local specialized legal organizations or institutions. Um, besides, of course, the gap in the organizational capacity of the uh, uh, active uh, GBV actors to, to provide legal services to women and girls. Um, the last one I would like to mention is the reduced fund uh, to GBV programs um, in Northwest Syria and particularly for women and girls uh, safe spaces. These safe spaces, um, we consider them as the primary entry for uh, GBV services in Northwest Syria, where women and girls uh, feel safe to disclose violations, seek legal support. Uh, in fact, uh, maintaining a good relationship and genuine trust with local communities require enhancing sustainability of these uh, of these centers. Uh, when it comes to opportunities, and uh, I mean, after analyzing the situation, current situation, field observation, many discussions with the field workers through these uh, field visits, uh, we see that um, the de-escalation of military action uh, in Northwest Syria could give us the opportunity um, or give the bless all protection actors uh, uh, the opportunity to focus more in developing context of appropriate legal remedies uh, to GBV cases. Uh, if we look at the structure of the governance, so the situation in Northern Aleppo is not that optimal with many uh, armed groups and no centralized, let's say, um, uh, governance structure. However, the situation in Aleppo could be 
somehow relatively better with one uh, uh, de facto governance structure, the Salvation Government uh, presence. Uh, besides what we also noticed that um, there is some kind of like increased awareness towards the importance of, of uh, providing GBEV or, or let's say uh, um, uh, protection to women and girls. Uh, many segments of the community, even people affiliated with de facto authorities in Northwest Syria acknowledge the importance of rule of law and also the need for legislations and uh, let's say strong gender friendly legal system that might be able to uh, address such issues or even protect women and girls after years of uh, legal system absence, chaos and anarchy. Um, we heard also from many uh, law practitioners and attorneys in Northwest Syria that they acknowledge the importance of strong legal system after all these as head of anarchy. Many of them even advocate uh, uh, for adequate equitable legislation that uh, uh, aims and protecting uh, women and girls. Uh, we sense a good opportunity to collaborate with many of them and have them as allies in our side in addressing these matters and promoting the uh, rule of law in Northwest Syria. Uh, finally, I would like to mention this increased global com community's uh, uh, interest in moving towards early recovery and legal remedies for realistic, relevant, uh, longer term outcomes. Uh, in fact, to provide a comprehensive GBV response, uh, many of, or let's say most of GBV cases require legal support, which can be provided just by focusing on emergency intervention only. Over, over to you, Lorena. Thank you very much, uh, Farid. Thank you. I would like to complement the points that you raised uh, uh, through Bahia Srikan from uh, Policy and Advocacy Manager from NRC Syria. So, uh, Bakia, over to you. Thank, thank you, you Marina, and thank you for, uh, for uh, hosting this event and uh, opening the, the Brussels Conference Week and, uh, and side events uh, to, to take it a little bit. Uh, um, I think a lot of the challenges have already been identified by, by all the, the my predecessors and um, Lack of civil documentation, of course, is is one of the the most important, and uh, I think we we saw it through the different present presentations at individual level and at household level. It can have an impact on everything: access to basic needs, from access to basic needs to access to a little bit more um, programs or activities that could allow people to be a bit more resilient, to to, to look into more durable solutions. Um, in a report that we released a few weeks ago, uh, we had one of our um, one of the people we work with or for saying, "I'm a dead person standing on two feet because I don't have civil documentation." And I think it's a very, very um, it's an image that that is really important and it really shows how much civil documentation can can be a lack of civil documentation can be a big barrier to to anything people are allowed or should be allowed to uh, to have access to on a, on a daily basis we are we are looking into a generation that is being raised uh, in in an invisible way a lot of children don't have access to education because of the the lack of civil documentation in the northwest we saw a lot of kids for example with heavy health issues who are supposed to be referred to turkey who could not go because of the lack of civil documentation because of the lack of identity etc so those challenges are important they have a huge impact on family household individuals i think it's also important to highlight maybe the presence of different civil documentations in Northeast and Northwest, those from de facto authorities and those from government of Syria, and how are they interacting with each other, how much sometimes they even increase risks, security risks, for example, on individuals to use one or the other. It's extremely confusing as well uh, in the environment to know when you can or you should be using your uh, government of Syria civil documentation or your uh, the documentation that is being delivered by the de facto authorities, how is it going to be accepted by the different uh, actors? And there, I think it's also important to make sure that people are not being punished or uh, or sanctioned because they have uh, civil documentation from, for example, the facto authorities in the Northwest or because they have government of Syria civil documentation and then they are being identified as being affiliated to one authority or the other. So that's also a protection risk that I think that um, have been raised, but maybe, maybe not as much as it should. 
Um, in terms of HLP, uh, House and Land and Properties, again, we, we released two, two reports, one on Northeast Syria, one on Northwest Syria a few weeks ago, and uh, um, where we highlight the question or the issue of confiscation of property that hasn't been uh, raised and uh, is important. I, I'll give a very slight example uh, of uh, one person that we have been talking to. Her name is Aisha. She lives in Hasaki. She has been living in Hasaki for 40 years. At some point, her husband had a... Um, had a work opportunity closer to Raqqa, so they left their land. Uh, they, they, they had the land, they were farmers, and they went to Raqqa and they rented the land. Um, unfortunately, the de facto authorities confiscated their lands, and Aisha had to go through years and years of uh, judicial procedure to be able to not even retrieve her land, but negotiate with the de facto authorities to have a small piece of land next to her land that she will be able to use. And unfortunately, because she lost her husband and because her children are outside of Syria, she was extremely vulnerable, of course, and she's too old, as she says herself, she's too old to fight and, and, uh, and she decided to compromise because she doesn't have anything else to do and she couldn't do anything else. So I think this is something that is really important. And actually the, the numbers uh, of, I mean, and the issue around confiscation of property by de facto authorities is, is rising in both Northeast and Northwest Syria. And it's uh, something that is really important to, to keep in mind. And then maybe one last challenge that haven't been uh, mentioned is the question around due diligence uh, from humanitarian actors. So uh, I know it's part of our, uh, our uh, process and uh, our programs, and we, we should be able to, to, um, to conduct proper due diligence. Uh, and the, I, for those who work in the Northeast, we, we all know the example of Abu Khashab camp, which is actually established on a private property. And there is an issue of due diligence around that camp and the, the authorization or not the absence of authorization from the owner to actually be able to use that camp as a camp, um, the, this land as a, as a camp. And, uh, and so I think as humanitarian actors, we need to also keep in mind that due diligence is important because it's part of our, uh, it should be part of our do harm process, all of us. And we, we need to be mindful of the fact that whatever our humanitarian response needs to be mindful of the fact that some of the areas where we work and the, the camps where we work might, might have due diligence uh, issues and HLP uh, problems. Um, and then the, it was really important to hear you say that we should be able to do more than just awareness. Um, and uh, in the Northwest, I think one of the biggest barriers, of course, is also the status of the de facto authorities and the, the question around counterterrorism legislation that does not allow actually humanitarian actors to do much in terms of legal assistance and access to justice. There is only that much we can do. And we have been in RC, for example, have been looking into how to support families to be able to to, to get uh, civil documentation and our support will always be limited because for example, we cannot provide, we can provide cash for protection for transportations, but we cannot provide cash for administrative fees because that means that those, uh, these administrative fees will be paid to an authority that is considered by, as a counter, as a terrorist organization. And so these kind of challenges make the, I mean, the Syrian context is extremely complicated and uh, maybe to step a little bit out of protection and look a bit at a broader picture, the funding um, needs are everywhere and all clusters and all sectors and uh, are somehow sadly competing with each other, trying to show how much their needs are more, more important than the others. And that's, that's the sad reality of Syria after 12 years of war. And I think this is the biggest challenge. And today, this is also, Looking into that and looking to increase humanitarian crisis and urgent emergencies outside of uh, of Syria, like Sudan, for example, Ukraine, etc. We're looking into a humanitarian funding landscape globally that is extremely uh, extremely challenging, and unfortunately, in the coming years, the funding will probably drop more than uh, than increase. And I think, on the other hand, the opportunity is that I think maybe there is more space. Uh, um, now to look into the future, to look into more early recovery, the famous nexus between humanitarian response and a, and a, and a more uh, longer term, more durable solutions, more resilience response, where we could think into or look into bringing other donors at the table. And I think the space for this conversation is now a little bit open. There is an opportunity mm -hmm. to have this conversation, even though uh, 
Syria being so politicized, it's going to be extremely difficult to convince any, uh, I mean, to, to shift from one, uh, one space to the other. But I think, uh, I think there is an opportunity that was created a bit also, unfortunately, by, by the earthquake and, uh, and by the current uh, change of context at regional level. Um, there is an opportunity at least to open some debates and uh, discuss some of the, the elephants in the room uh, at global level uh, around Syria, around the, the humanitarian ar architecture, around access to Northwest, Northeast Syria. All those conversations have a little bit of space, I think, of, could have a little bit of space and, uh, and, uh, and we need to seize the opportunity as a humanitarian community um, and, uh, and be able to, to seize that opportunity. and. Uh, and try to to make space for us to to raise voices the, our voices a little bit stronger, and uh, and be able to uh, yeah to to do our best to provide more uh, for their response and uh, including for the protection side of it. Thank Baya, you. Thank you very much. Uh, before we we close, I wanted to check from your side, Hosan, if there are any other points uh, that you want to mention in this discussion of challenges and actions. Our colleague Hosan is from IRC in Northeast Syria. <coughs> Are you there, Hosan? Yes, good evening. Hi, we can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good evening. I will present my presentation by Arabic language. Uh, we'll mention the challenges and risks that uh, we didn't mention from my uh, uh, colleagues. So, in relation to the issue of the issues of the issues of the issues of the issues of the HLP of the issues 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 التحديات والمخاطر الحماية اللي ما ذكرت من قبل زملائي أول شيء العودة الطوعية العودة الطوعية من المخيمات في شمال شرق سوريا الآن هي محكومة بنقطتين أولا الوسائق المدنية أي حدا ما عنده وسائق مدنية لا يمكن أنه يسجل في رحلات العودة خاصة إذا كان من مناطق من غير مناطق شمال شرق سوريا النقطة الثانية المتعلقة بال HLP كثير من النازحين ما عم يقدروا يرجعوا للمناطق الأصلية تبعهم لأنه بيوتهم مدمرة أو هي محتلة من قبل ميليشيات عسكرية وهي أحد تحديات اللي عم تواجه موضوع الحلول الدائمة في شمال شرق سوريا النقطة الثانية هو موضوع الأطفال اللي هن أطفال عائلات سواء داعش أو الثيرت كانتري ناشونال في آلاف من هدول الأطفال بالمخيمات ما عندهم جنسية غير مسجلين قانونيا لا يملكون الشخصية القانونية وهذا خطر يعني جدا كبير في شمال شرق سوريا ويحتاج إلى تدخل فوري لمعالجة هذه المشكلة النقطة الثالثة هي النسبة كبيرة من مكتومي القيد اللي هن عديمي الجنسية من الأكراد لا يزالون في مخيمات شمال شرق سوريا أو مناطق شمال شرق سوريا وخاصة مخيم واشوكاني هؤلاء لا يملكون الجنسية السورية لأسباب سياسية تعود تاريخها إلى 1962 النقطة اللي بعدها هو العودة القسرية اللي عم تتم حالياً للسوريين سواء من لبنان أو من مناطق المحتلة من قبل الفصائل المدعومة من تركيا العائدين من لبنان يتم إعادة السوريين قسراً من لبنان لأنهم لا يملكون بطاقة لاجئ أو إقامة شرعية وهؤلاء عم يعودوا لمناطق في شمال شرق سوريا بتكون بيوتهم محتلة من نفس الجهة التي طردتهم من لبنان وللأسف يعني نقطة أخرى هو عدم أو تقييد الحركة في المخيمات في عندنا مخيمات مغلقة مثل مخيم الهول في نازحين من كل المحافظات السورية بالإضافة إلى آلاف من ثيرت كانتري ناشونال فاميليز 
ما عم بيقدروا يطلعوا براءة المخيم لإصدار أو تجديد وثائق المدنية. النقطة اللي بعدها هو عدم تسجيل أو المنظمات لدى الحكومة السورية وهذا الشيء بيمنع التمثيل القانوني أنشطة التمثيل القانوني للمستفيدين فالأنشطة القانونية تقتصر على يعني جلسات رفع التوعية وتقديم الاستشارات القانونية اليون اس ار كان عندهم تجربة منيحة مع الهلال الأحمر, الأحمر السوري وكان عندهم برنامج تمثيل قانوني فهي الخطوة إذا قدرنا نشتغل عليها بالمرحلة القادمة سواء مع الهلال الأحمر السوري أو أي شركاء محليين قادرين على التمثيل القانوني فبنكون يعني عالجنا تقريبا نصف المشكلة فيما يتعلق بموضوع القانون في شمال شرق سوريا المحاكم السورية موجودة في المربعات الأمنية وتمارس سلطة القضاء للأحوال المدنية للHLP لنقل الملكية إصدار وسائق الحالة المدنية باستمرار لكن السلطة القضائية للإدارة الذاتية هي تفتقر للخبرات القانونية تفتقر للقوانين بنلاقي القضاة ما عندهم خبرة أو حتى خلفية قانونية ممكن يكون خريج علم الاجتماع أو خريج رياضيات وهو بيكون عم يمارس مهنة القضاء بالنسبة للخطوات ممكن نقلل من هاي المشكلة مثل ما ذكرت هو أنه يكون في ترخيص للمنظمات هاي الخطوة نشتغل عليها بالمرحلة القادمة لحتى يكون في تمثيل قانوني آه، اثنين نزيد من أنشطة الكاش فور بروتكشن والكاش فور ليجل لحتى نساعد المستفيدين آه، لحتى يطالعوا الوسائق تبعهم نبني قدرات السلطات المحلية على مواضيع متعلقة بحقوق الإنسان والقانون الدولي الإنساني واتفاقية السيداو ونشجعهم أنه يحطوا مبادئ حقوق الإنسان ضمن القوانين اللي هن رح يصدروها المناصرة مع السلطات المحلية لحتى يكون في حرية حركة من وإلى المخيمات لحتى نمنح للنازحين يكون عندهم قدرة لحتى يسجلوا أحوالهم المدنية وبنفس الوقت نمنع أنه يكون شرط العودة الطوعية هو وجود الوساق أي حدا ممكن يعود لمنطقته سواء لاجئين عراقيين أو نازحين سوريين ما يكون شرط أن يكون حامل لوسائق مدني هذا من طرف إذا في أي سؤال أنا شكرا Thank you very much. I know we have uh, different requests for intervention uh, on the chat. Uh, we are 10 minutes past uh, the time of the side event. So if, if we agree, maybe we could just give the floor to the ones that have not uh, raised their issues before. So Lutfi, you were there from the previous discussion. If you want to take the floor really quickly, please go ahead. Hello, I will speak in Arabic. Go ahead. Tamam. Uh, go ahead. Okay. I want to put a few points. First, I want to thank you a lot for this meeting, which was a lot of information. Two points I want to remember. The first point I want to put a number of small or small small children who are responsible for the children. اللي هن مهمشين جدا نتيجة انه هن اباء غير سوريين كثير جنسيات اخرى بحكم الحرب او الازمه السوريه جنسيات اخرى كانوا مقاتلين بالسياق السوري هؤلاء قاموا بالزواج من سوريات وبعد فتره قتلوا او او غادروا سوريا وعادوا الى بلدانهم خلفوا اطفال هذول الاطفال الى الان هم مجهولون نسب نوعا ما اذا كان اذا كان الاب موجود فالاب ما معه ابدا اي 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 وثائق قانونيه هذول الاطفال بالتالي هن مجهولين نسب بشكل تام غير معروف حتى في بعض الحالات اسماء الاب في اكثر من حاله نحن في وطن اطلعنا عليها 
لاشخاص يعني لزوجات ما بيعرفوا اسماء ازواجهم بيعرفوا باسم مستعار فقط لا غير عدد كم هائل بي بي يعني ممكن نوصل هذا العدد لالاف من من الاطفال نتيجه ظروف معينه نتيجه كثير من العقبات غير قادرين على الوصول لهؤلاء الاشخاص فضلا عن هدول النساء اللي ممكن يكون منهم في عمر صغير او او طفلات متزوجات من من جنسيات اخرى وهم سوريات وازواجهم قد يكونوا غادروهم فهني اصبحوا طفله ترأس عائله او طفله ام هاي النقطة الأولى النقطة الثانية بدي أحكي عن 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 موضوع الاختلاف بالوسائق بين عدة مناطق هاي النقطة كتير نقطة حساسة ومهمة وعدم الاعتراف بين إذا عم نحكي بي بشمال غرب وشمال شرق فنحن عم نحكي عن حكومتين حكومتين بتم إصدار وسائق مختلفة قد يتغير سيطر السيطرة من مكان إلى مكان وبالتالي هاي الوسائق عم بتكون غير معترف عليا بهذا المكان الشغله الاخيره عدد هائل من النازحين الان يسكن بادلب ممتلكات واراضي ومنازل موجوده في 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 اماكن قد تسيطر عليها جماعات اخرى وغير قادرين نتيجه كثير ظروف على الوصول لها وبالتالي لما عم بيصير في اي تغيير بالملكيه فحتى ما عم بيقدروا انه يسجلوا هي الملكيات انا انتهيت شكرا كثير Thank you very much, uh, Lutfi. Fatma, one minute, really quickly. Uh, thank you very much. Just I want to add something. Maybe it's not mentioned during the conversation. And what, in addition, what for what Sarah, Bahia, and Hosan mentioned related for our uh, legal identity and that shall be. On the first, we need to to make sure that if and if we have um, de facto authority. On northeast of Syria, there is a, a different a judicial system. Uh, we lack for a uh, land registry department, which is not allowed for the people to access to get their documentation and to prove their ownership over their land, and with, which is uh, totally difficult for proving their um, ownership or to uh, enjoy their security of tenure. This is the first point. The second point it's related for in doing and continue of confiscating the land from uh, self-administration, uh, from the people who is uh, living inside uh, the camps or if they want to establish uh, any new uh, formal or informal settlement, especially Bahia mentioned for Abu Khashab, there is the Lissamen, Nairuz camp and different area that still a separate land and that need a lot of advocacy and uh, work with the administration to respect HLB rights. The second point it's related for uh, um, the uh, law and um, the uh, what is uh, implemented uh, by self-administration for given women uh, equal right for uh, men on having inheritance share, which is agreed about uh, the, the men they are preferred to go for uh, US court to claim their rights. At the same time, if there is any case as raised on US court, the self-administration court, they directly rejected any uh, case that appointed or uh, sued by female staff there, then they will not accept any uh, claim from women. At the same time, they didn't have any enforcement uh, department either to enforce the decision, the court decision from us uh, offer the land on self-administration area or uh, even to give the people the right a uh, title for um, proofing their uh, HLB uh, documentation. This is the first for um, the HLB. The second one, it's related for civil documentation and legal identity and registered the vital offense for uh, the IDBs and refugees inside the camps. Even inside the camps, from camp to camp on northeast of Syria, we have different procedures. So if for the people who's moving from camp to other, they have to follow different procedures, even though it is on the same area for North East of Syria. Maybe uh, the, the point that we have to mention for it is the national, uh, the third national countries and the children on the whole and its camp. Uh, those children who has to be moved when they reach 10, 
up to 12 years old and be separated from their moms. Um, they are uh, putting on uh, a rehabilitation center and uh, they didn't have, you know, their moms, they didn't have any information about their situation, which is need a lot of work from ICRC and other um, uh, human rights uh, actors to make sure that there is a sharing information about their situation and to make sure that the family will not be separated. In addition, for the Iraqi refugee who have to register for uh, repartition um, a trips to leave the whole camp to uh, Iraq, it's a complicated uh, process from Iraqi community as well as from NISA authority side, which is need to have more advocacy offered to facilitate such uh, a process and to make sure even those people who didn't have any legal document, they will be have a chance to uh, have the right to return back to their um, home and to decide about their uh, uh, travel solution and how they want to decide if they want to stay on uh, the camps or to, to re return back either to their country or to the third country to be settlement for their situation. This is a brief for the points that I want to highlight. Thank you. Thank you, Fatma. Thank you very much. Uh, there are many issues that uh, have like particularities for Northeast, Northwest. However, we identify three specific asks from this conversation that we have had today. The first one is linked to we need funding to guarantee that we will be able to create the capacity, most of all at the community level, to understand what rule of law is and also to prepare for the next stages. One of the key issues that we need to highlight is that there have been many changes at the political level um, in the recent months that could imply a political transition to somewhere. We don't know exactly where, but uh, the main concern is have we prepared communities to face any transitional issues that will come their way? And we believe we haven't. So the, the initial ask is we need the capacity in place to help communities to understand what the rule of law means, to be able to engage with the new changes that will come their way. And this is main, the main reason why we are saying we need to shift from the humanitarian response um, that we have done for the past years, and then move into more structural related issues that will help communities to engage with rule of law but also to have a active participation in the development of what could look as transitional justice, issues related to truth, um, reparations, restitution, and communities don't have those tools right now. So the, we need the funding capacity for that. The second one is we need to engage and increase our advocacy. And advocacy is more related to um, how we can help this transitional justice to guarantee that communities will be at the center of it, understanding, as Theo mentioned before, that there are some gaps in terms of obligations from the different actors. When we talk about forced displacement, the recognition is that there was a failure to protect civilians, and that implies that there has to be in place some level of accountability, and we need to work on advocacy-related issues to guarantee that this process will be engaged with accountability, but also that we will be able to explain or identify what would be the alternatives to guarantee that communities in North and Northeast was, uh, will be able to access um, this rule of law. And the third one uh, is that we are asking also our partners to give us uh, some level of flexibility. We understand that in the past, the red lines have been very strong. However, as, as Bahia was mentioning, we, we do share the belief that, uh, unfortunately, the earthquake created opportunities also in the understanding of donors of what's needed in Northeast and Northwest. We, take, we, we need to take full advantage of those opportunities, and that implies that we need help from our partners to be able to address in a different way the gaps that we are identifying right now, not linked to individual provision of services, but more into a community-based approach when we can help communities to transition to whatever this, uh, this, this future is holding for them, we believe it will imply a comprehensive understanding of an engagement 
with rule of law. So we are asking also our partners to um, embark with us in this discussion on innovative ways to bring call protection response to communities uh, on the ground, understanding that yes, there are still sensitiveness and red lines, but we need to make the identification of where these red lines can be pushed a little further, or maybe where we are stuck, we are stuck with the previous red lines and, and there is more space to work in some of these issues. Guish, if you want to add some ask that I didn't mention, please uh, over to you so you can make the closure of the side event. Thank you so much, uh, everyone. Thank you so much, Lenra. I think uh, you already highlighted what I have also trying to, to capture my notebook and then you highlighted very well. Uh, I will use this opportunity to thank everyone for um, sharing the experiences and the expertise um, with us today. Um, I'm hoping that um, the gap that we have is more or less similar and we need a joint effort to, to address the gaps that we have. And also this kind of political dynamism, right? The geopolitical dynamism that we are um, probably going to experience soon will be, will be uh, I think an opportunity for us also to influence. Uh, because um, the funding was like just going down. If you see the protection sector in general, like in Northeast Syria, in the whole of Syria, I think, it's less than 10% funded uh, comparing to the request that we have been requesting at the beginning of the year. So it is very important to highlight that if we are not addressing those issues, it's going to be very difficult. And there is the livelihood and um, the living condition of the population is like, 90%, 80% of the population is going down below poverty, just city level. So if we don't understand uh, this situation and try to address those issues, it's going to be uh, worse and worse again. So I'm not going to um, highlight anything because you already mentioned all of them. So I would like to appreciate for the organizers as well. It was really enriching for all of us. And uh, I'm just expecting um from this joint effort a positive response especially for the funding which will have like a positive result for the communities who are counting on us thank you so much really appreciate for your time and contribution thank you very much and thank you very much to all our panelists and uh the people that stayed with us in these 24 additional minutes have uh, an amazing week and thank you again bye